Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, it's a couple of minutes after one o'clock. Um, just a warm welcome to everybody who's taken the time to join us today. Um, welcome to our third and final lecture in our lunchtime learning series for our level seven postgraduate diploma in HR management. Today's lecture is how HR can take a lead on driving equality. And it's being delivered by Alex Phillips, HR and leadership lecturer from the business school who lectures on the course. So a very warm welcome to Alex. Um, my name is Paula Harrison and I'm the coordinator of University Centre Telford which is one of three regional learning centres of the University of Wolverhampton. I'm joined today, as I said, by Alex and also by my colleague, um, Shelley, who is um, from our Stafford Centre. So a warm welcome to Shelley as well. Before I introduce Alex formally um, and hand over to her, I just wanted to um, explain that there'll be an opportunity throughout the lecture to ask questions. Um, via the Q&A button. Now, if you're using a laptop or a desktop, um, the icon is at the bottom of your screen in the middle. Um, and if you're using a mobile, it will be in the top right hand corner. So if you post your questions there and then I'll read them out um, for, for Alex. We're delighted to welcome Alex, as I said, for the lecture today. She teaches on the Level 7 Postgraduate Diploma in HR Management, which is offered at our city campus in Wolverhampton, as well as at Southwater in Telford. And it will also be offered at our Stafford Centre from January. And just a little bit of background uh, for Alex. Alex came to the education sector following 10 years in retail management. Um, where she oversaw generalist HR roles and responsibilities. She's also worked in training and development roles within the retail sector. Her areas of interest and specialisms are performance management and pedagogic approaches. So the ways in which um, we teach adult learners. She did her degree and her master's degree at the University of Wolverhampton as a mature student um, with two young children managing domestic responsibilities whilst trying to advance her career led to her interest in the ways in which HR can drive equality forward and how this can benefit both employer and employee. So I'll hand over to Alex now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paula. Okay, so we're going to be looking at driving equality through HR processes. What I've tried to do for you today is sort of replicate what we do in the classroom. So there's a few questions, although you can ask questions, I'm hoping that as we work through, you'll be able to suggest some answers, some of the questions I'll be throwing out to yourselves in the Q&A bit. Um, if Paula, you'd be able to let me know if there's any responses come through on there. Um, yeah. I'll be talking you through. So it won't look, it won't feel exactly like one of my classes would, but I'm hoping that you sort of get a feel for how we would um, run one of the lecture seminar type classes. Um, so this is sort of how we'd start um, one of our lectures or seminars is looking at what we're looking to achieve during that session. So in this one particularly, we're going to outline equality in the workplace. And we're going to establish key differences between equality and diversity. Um, they generally come hand in hand, they roll off the tongue together, but they're actually quite different concepts, quite different terms. We're then going to look at building a business case for equality in the workplace. You think it's just what everyone does. It just makes good sense, but actually it's not always what we see in organisations. We're then going to review some HR processes that influence and steer the equality agenda. Now, by no means will we be covering all of them, but we'll be looking at a few um, process, processes that I deliver on my module on this course. Um, before we go any further then, I think Paula, I'm handing over to yourself and Shelley for these couple. Okay, yes. We just thought we'd take the opportunity to um, talk about the regional learning centres both at Telford and at Stafford. As we've said before, um, we offer the Level 7 Postgraduate Diploma in HR Management that Alex teaches on. Um, <coughs> we also offer um, the CIM Certificate in Marketing, both professional and digital. We also offer some courses in education, post-compulsory education, 
um, and a BA top up in special educational needs, disability, family and inclusion. And we also host courses from our partners, Telford College and Telford and Rekin Council. We offer bespoke information, advice and guidance to members of the community um, who can drop in um, for that service. And we talk about progression and higher education. We run business support um, and um, offer events and one-to-one -one business advice in the centre. We do a huge amount of partnership development and community engagement events. Uh, we run a programme of public lectures, which normally take place in the centre, but obviously because of the current pandemic, um, they have moved online um, and have been um, really successful. Tonight we're running a public lecture on zombies. Um, if anyone is interested, something completely different. Um, and we also consult locally to assess and define local demand. We're looking at um, market building activity to update and expand our course offer. So we never really stand still. So we're based on the top floor of the Southwater building in Telford for those of you who are local. And I'll hand over now to Shelley who will have a, um, a little chat about um, the Stafford Centre. Hi, yeah, I'm Shelley. Um, so at the Stafford Centre, it's quite similar. Um, we aim to widen access to higher education in the local area. So we do this by offering higher education um, taster sessions on things like BSL and marketing and um, Photoshop and things like that. Uh, we do short courses, undergraduate and postgraduate degrees and um, CPD. Uh, the offers that we've got hopefully starting in um, January it will be the diploma in HR management um, and there'll be the CIM certificate in professional and digital and foundation degree in working with children in primary education. We also offer the information advice and guidance careers and, and that kind of thing at the centre again drop in or make an appointment and um, public engagement so we do all sorts of things around Stafford. So that's that's us in a nutshell. Thanks, Shelley. Okay, thanks, Paula. Thanks, Shelley. Okay, then. If you can, then, and if you've got a bit of an idea, I'd like to sort of get your ideas as to what you think equality in the workplace is. So if you can drop your ideas into the Q&A section. So what does equality in the workplace look like to you? It might be really useful for you to think about perhaps organisations you either currently work for or have worked for in the past perhaps reflect upon those. Anything coming through? Not at the moment. Okay, no problem. Okay, so a couple of key, um, key terms. If anything comes to you as we go through, just drop it in the Q&A. There'll be a few more little questions like that. I'll give you a bit of time to drop it in. Um, so equality is there are a lot of definitions for this but for today we'll work with the state of being equal especially in status rights or opportunities and um, we're also looking at equal opportunities so the idea that everyone should be given the same opportunities as those who have traditionally held power um, an alternative view on this is the view that people should be treated equally regardless of race ethnic origin gender sexual orientation and other social categories now this starts to feed into some of the legislative underpinning, which we'll very briefly review later on. Um, and then moving on, sorry, so that individuals are enabled freely and equally to compete for social rewards. So we're talking about giving everyone a fair chance, giving everyone the same opportunities effectively when we're talking about equality and equal opportunities. Now in class, what we do is start by looking at the key terms, defining those key terms, because our understanding of these key terms can really change the way that we interpret it into um, embedding policies and procedures within the workplace. So it's really, really key that we all have a similar, if not the same understanding of these key terms when it comes to HR and when it comes to managing people within organisations. Okay. Now, like I said at the start, equality and diversity come hand in hand, and often it's associated that these two terms must be the same. Um, but research tells us that actually 
they are distinctly different terms. So if you can have a little bit of a think about this, how might diversity and equality be different? If you've got any suggestions, drop it into the Q&A. So often equality is concerned with, like I said on the former uh, slide, it's concerned with um, treating everyone the same. We assume that everyone is the same and that everyone should have the same treatment. Diversity is actually concerned with an appreciation that everyone is actually different. We're not all the same. We don't all come to an organisation with the same experiences the same upbringing, the same value set, and that can really shape and change the culture of an organisation. So although equality and diversity, we tend to use them flippantly and we tend to bring them together, it's really important that we appreciate that they're actually distinctly different, they're different processes, however they are related to each other. Um, it's important that we understand the differences and we don't use these terms interchangeably because if we're requesting equality within a workplace, and someone understands this to be diversity, they may start to embed practices, procedures or policies that don't actually achieve this and vice versa for diversity. If we're looking to increase participation from a particular societal group and we're embedding equality and equal opportunities type processes and policies, then we might not end up with the diverse workforce that we're looking for. So this is what we call the equality and diversity paradox. So if we are offering equal opportunities, so the same opportunities to everyone, this doesn't necessarily equate to equality. So if everyone is treated in the exact same way, there is an assumption that we are all coming to an organisation starting on the same footing. We've all had the same experiences before. Okay, so overcoming the equality and diversity paradox. Now, Dewson and Mason in 1986 theorised that equal opportunities approaches could be split into two categories. So we can split them into two categories. The first being liberal, and this is based on the principles of sameness, which is what I've just discussed and gone over. So equality and um, equal opportunity practices in its purest sense refers to this more liberal approach. So this may include what we call positive action. Um, and positive action the activities and attempts made by an organisation to remove as far as possible the obstacles to the operation of the free labour market and meritocracy. This is legal, this is considered lawful. Now, the flip to this is a radical approach to equality. So it suggests intervention wherever is necessary in order to achieve equality of opportunity, as well as equality of outcome. Now, this might include attempts to positively discriminate, and this is considered unlawful. So some of the active activities associated with positive discrimination are what we call quotas. So attempting to achieve a certain number or level of employees from a particular social character um, category, category, sorry. Um, and that, like I say, is considered unlawful. So as an organization, if you are putting some measures in place to achieve a more diverse workforce, we need to make sure that this is based on fact, that we are basing it on data and our actions are wholly lawful. And we will come back to this um, later on in the um, PowerPoint. So paradigm of managing diversity. Now paradigm means a model of something or a very clear and typical example of something. Um, often students get paradigm and paradox mixed up, so it's an important one to point out because they're quite different. So an idea of equal opportunities um, is that although it's an extension, sorry, diversity is an extension of equal opportunities, as we can see below, managing diversity is still having an appreciation that it's different from equal opportunities. So what a good um, some best practice or some good practice for organisations is to consider what they're looking for on the other side of this. So what levels of diversity are they looking for within their organisation before they start looking at what equal opportunities um, practices they're going to put into place. Now, although previously I've said radical, a radical approach to equality is often associated with positive discrimination, actually we can take some principles from it. Um, that allow us to achieve a diverse workforce without being unlawful. Okay, so just to legally underpin this, put some legislation underneath this, with everything we do on this HR course, 
and we will always underpin it with law because without being aware of what the legislation is we cannot put these policies these practices into place within an organization it has to um, springboard off the legislation so the Equality Act 2010 covers all areas of discrimination law so there's nine protected characteristics listed here so age disability gender reassignment marriage and civil partnership pregnancy and maternity race religion or belief sex and sexual orientation um, and these characteristics are protected by the Equality Act you are the it's one of the misunderstandings about the Equality Act is that um, perhaps um, you are only protected if you are disabled, but it works both ways. It, it protects those who are, those who aren't, and as for the same with all the other characteristics as well. So discrimination is generally unlawful at all stages of employment. So it's incredibly important within HR that we're aware of this. So from hiring through to termination and sometimes beyond. So if we terminate uh, someone's job and then we just re-recruit for it, that would be unlawful. Um, job advertisements which discriminate are also unlawful so we can see actually this doesn't just relate to once we've got someone within the organisation it stretches much before that and much beyond this thereafter. So we can see that equality in the workplace it just isn't a choice it is a legal obligation so the Equality Act makes it a legal obligation. Based on this, you'd assume that all organisations have embraced it and put it at their core, but that isn't actually what we find. Um, there are tokenistic approaches to the Equality Act, and this generally comes from organisations not appreciating that equality is good for business. So if you can't find the justification in the moral um, and the social obligation, then just knowing that it's good for business should be enough. Now, a lot of organisations underestimate how good equality in the workplace is for good for business. So I'm going to cover this a little bit now. And we, I think we're probably going to struggle to do this. So I'll start to move on. But this is the sort of activity that we would do in class. So we would look at building a business case. Now, within HR, it's incredibly important that we're able to build a business case as there's something called the value added debate. HR seems to be subjected more than any other department within um, business, within organisations, to constant scrutiny. So a constant need to justify what it is that they do and the value of what they do. Um, there's been a real um, focus on HR metrics, so HR numbers, as a means to prove what it is that HR does. Actually, often with, when you're with, within HR, when you work within HR, you start to appreciate that a lot of what HR does you can't put an actual monetary value on. So we have to make attempts to do this and we have to be able to evidence some either direct or indirect link to that bottom line within an organisation and um, before um, we get the, the top execs ears um, and persuade them to embed these practices and policies that we know work well for an organisation. Okay, so just to summarise some of the business case for Equal Ops. So the business case is concerned with treatment, making good, sorry, fair treatment, making good business sense. Anything within HR that we do, we have to have a business case for. It needs to make good business sense. It being a moral obligation is just not enough anymore. Um, because it's better for human resources if it leads um, to a wider customer base. It creates a wider pool for recruitment and selection and it leads to positive company image. Now, positive company image um, is sometimes confused with marketing um, and it, it leads to attracting more customers. But actually, if we have a positive company image, what we're able to do is attract the top talent and that top 10 percent, the creme de la creme, are the ones that we're looking for. And having a good company brand image is how we attract them. Um, progressive organisations have long considered that there to be a business case argument for developing equality policies and diverse strategies and that there's a social and moral, moral argument to do so too. So the social and moral argument I don't think can be debated. What's constantly up for debate is the business case for equal opportunities. Um, so when you get into organisations, it's about proving that actually um, providing equal opportunities and building equality into the core of the organisation is just simply good for business. Okay, <clears throat> so the way in which we do that is through a number of processes. Um, and HR are able to lead the equality agenda 
through a number of processes. Now we're going to look at recruitment and selection, reward management and talent management amongst many others. Um, so these are the ones we'll look at, but there are many, many others that you can go into. Now the reason I picked these are because these are the three that sit on my module. Um, okay. Okay, so recruitment and selection, much like the equality and diversity terms get bungled together, um, they get said really quickly one after the other, and the assumption is therefore made that recruitment and selection are the same. Um, can anyone identify how they might be different? So what activities do we associate with recruitment and which do we associate with selection? Anything in the Q&A? Nothing yet, Alex. Oh, yes, there is a comment. I was just going to reiterate for those who've joined us um, a little bit later is that there is a Q&A okay, yeah. button um, and you can post comments and questions. Um, Sean says advertising. Is recruitment or selection? Is that recruitment? Um, yes, recruitment. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. So the advertisement portion of it is part of the attraction process. So attraction and recruitment, actually we can, we can position those, we can put those together. Um, any ideas as to what selection refers to? So what activity selection would refer to? Um, decision making and interviewing. Amazing. I'm glad you said interviewing and we'll come to that in a second, but absolutely it's about the decision making. And also assessment processes from another. Great. Thing. Yeah. So you're listing them all now. So these are the selection processes. So it might be an interview. Um, and multiple um, types of interviews. We have phone interviews, we have panel interviews, um, but we also have assessment centres, which I think is what the last comment was getting at. That is part of the selection process as well. So it's anything that allows us to whittle down the candidates. So the recruitment section is about attracting them, about bringing them in. The selection is about whittling them down. Um, selection can be broken down in a number of processes. So the first element is the shortlisting particularly if it's a job that's going to attract a lot of candidates what we want to do first is shortlist it and then select so shortlisting is about so, um, whittling it down on mass without taking too much effort okay so they are quite different they're different processes and for the purposes of today we'll deal with them together and um, this is something that i deliver a four-hour session on so it's um i'm just giving you a whirlwind view of it and um, so some of the things it includes is managing the employer brand image advertisement as we, i think we've already established so where are we advertising it are we is it advertised in such a way that any candidate can see it is the way we advertise um is it in a newspaper that perhaps there's only a portion of the of society that tends to read tends to pick up and read it there aren't many people now um, who tend to go out and buy print we we all tend to access our news online or predominantly online now um, so if we are putting it into a newspaper, for example, there is going to be a certain portion of society who have an advantage there. So we have to consider, are they the people we're looking for? So it's not only, it's not only bad for equality, actually, we're not reaching the wider talent pool that we, we need to be reaching to fill these positions. Um, with regards to actual applications, we need to remove unnecessary information. Um, we're going to keep coming back to this term and I'll show you in a minute, but unconscious bias, um, which, you know, it is what it says. It's about the biases that we hold, but just not aware of. Often they're deep seeded, often they're based on um, our cultural surroundings, on our upbringing. Um, but we all carry unconscious bias one way or another. Um, and if we ask for unnecessary information, we increase the likelihood that these unconscious biases may creep into the process. We increase the opportunity for them to creep in. And um, so another way is unconscious bias training for hiring personnel. So we need to make sure that those who are involved with the recruitment and selection process are trained in unconscious bias. Once you are aware of it and your ability to hold those unconscious biases, they're much easier to manage. What we need to also do is review potential barriers 
and challenge previous hiring data. So as I said earlier about positive action, this is a lawful thing to be doing, but it needs to be based on data. Uh, but data helps us through the whole of the process, through the whole of the employment cycle, life cycle. So being aware of who we've recruited previously and collecting demographic information where possible, we're able to see who, what is the demographic of our last five recruits within a previous role? Are they all looking very similar? Um, did they come with the things that we needed? Um, is there a problem with our advertisement? Is there a problem with our selection process if we are consistently recruiting someone who looks the same time again, time and time again? So we need to make sure, it, it may just be coincidence, but it may be that we have a systemic problem within our recruitment and, pro, uh, recruitment and selection processes. And um, we need to make sure that more, more than one person is involved. Now, this isn't a legal obligation. This is just good sense. The more people involved with the recruitment selection process, the less likely we are to introduce those unconscious bias assumptions. Um, this becomes much easier once we have broke the back of diversity within our workforce, because what we're able to do is select a range of people with different experiences coming from different cultural backgrounds. And we're able to bring them into the recruitment selection process and they're able to see perhaps where we have barriers to um, access to jobs from particular portions within society. Um, so breaking the back of diversity within a workplace is the hardest part. Once we have a good mix of employees coming from all different walks of life, it becomes much easier. Um, design jobs with flexibility in mind. Now, this is something I'm quite passionate about. So if a job doesn't require someone to be in the office five days a week, don't ask them to be in the office five days a week. More progressive companies are proving that this isn't necessary. This is just one example of flexibility. Now, as we've gone through COVID, many more organisations are starting to see the benefit of providing some level of flexibility, allowing people to balance their domestic responsibilities with their professional responsibilities. And they're starting to reap the rewards. They're starting to listen to what HR practitioners and academics have been saying for years, allow flexibility. And actually, you'll reap the rewards for that. Um, so it's really important that we, we manage what we're asking for in a job appropriately and where there is room for flexibility that we embed that in the job description and the person specification. Um, it, it's really good for business because what we're able to do is widen the talent search. The people who will apply for this role will widen, you cast the net further than if you were just to ask for someone who's able to be in the office nine to five, five days a week. Um, it, it allows us to attract a broader talent range. Okay, um, we mentioned earlier when we were talking about selection, interviews came up straight away and that is no surprise to me. When we talk about selection, um, interviews is generally the first form of selection that people consider. Actually, what research tells us is it offers a low level of reliability and predictability. So when it comes to being able to recruit the right person for that job, interviews aren't necessarily the most reliable form to do that. The reason being is they are subject to some of these effects here. So we have expectancy theory, self-fulfilling prophecy effect, primacy effect, stereotyping effect, prototyping effect, halo horns effect, and the contrast effect. Now all of these have links to unconscious bias, which we're going to go into a little bit more. But it's about all those stereotypes that we have about people. It might be that when someone walks into a room, they tell us, I don't know, potentially they're a Wolves fan. And our last experience of a Wolves fan was pretty terrible. And so all of a sudden we have these views of this person. Well, the last Wolves fan I met was dreadful. And you are a Wolves fan, so you must be dreadful. So it's really important that we manage those unconscious biases that link into these effects. Now, these effects, we go into a little more detail. Um, within class, but with the time restraints, we won't be able to, but there's lots on the internet about these effects that can creep into our recruitment and selection processes amongst other processes within HR. So if you are interested, just drop these uh, terms in online, you'll be able to find lots about them. Okay. Um, any ideas as to how we might reduce um, the, the stereotypes that we have or this unconscious bias that we might have during the interview process. Any ideas? Uh, 
Okay, we'll move on. If anything comes into your mind, just drop it into the Q&A and we'll go over it. Now, I've gone over a couple, so it's about making sure that we have perhaps one or two people on the recruitment and selection panel. Does that one come through, Paula? Yes, yes um, from Sean. Be honest with the co-interviewer that this might be an issue for you. Absolutely. That would take such a high level of self-awareness. And what we're hoping actually is that people who are in the recruitment and selection um, team, anyone involved in hiring, so any hiring personnel, is able to manage those, um, those unconscious biases. Um, but absolutely, if there's going to be a problem, it's something that we hope that they would flag if, not be, if they're not able to manage it. So absolutely. Thanks for that, Sean. You've been very busy on that Q&A. <laughs> okay. With everything we do... Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, it's okay. Uh, from Holly, interviewer training and briefing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, that's a really interesting one. We'll come to that again in a sec. But it's really important that hiring personnel are trained. I don't know about anyone else, but I've been to a number of interviews. And within five minutes, I've got this feeling that actually the person sat in front of me wasn't necessarily anything to do with hiring. They haven't been trained to do it. They were just the right person because they were there. They were the person who was there in the morning and had got a bit of time that day to do it. It's not effective. We need to know that the people who are in charge of our recruitment and selection have been trained to do so. Otherwise, we stand a good chance of unconscious biases starting to come in. And it's so counterintuitive for equality and equality of opportunities. Is that okay. another one, Paula? Yes, um, following the person spec as well. Fantastic, yeah. So making sure that you've got your job description, your person spec, making sure that it's rigorously followed, um, that we are consistently referring back to some level of competency framework. Again, this is a equality, so it's about treating everyone the same when it comes to that process once they've got into that interview room and dealing with them um, consistently and fairly. Okay. So with everything we do on this module and the course, as it's accredited by CIPD, we will always use CIPD as a frame of reference. We'll keep going back to it and we will underpin it with what CIPD has to say about it. And that's not to say we won't challenge what CIPD has to say. We will consistently challenge everything. Um, and that's a lot of what we do in HR Academia is challenge, um, not necessarily... Um, what what you do at work but just what is considered to be best practice what is common practice we will challenge it so CIPD's viewpoint on this is to ensure fair and successful selection insights from a number of selection methods should be used in the decision making process so like I say interviews tend to be considered to have low levels of reliability and predictability they consider assessment centres to have high levels of predictability yet the interview process is in there. And that's because we use it alongside a number of other selection methods. So it increases our ability to predict whether this person in front of us is going to be good at the job. Um, it's easy to unconsciously introduce bias to selection procedures. So using a structured and rigorous approach is essential. So that was a really good point about the job description, the person spec. That's one um, document we're able to consistently refer back to and paired with perhaps a competency framework that allows us to matrix and, and plot where they are on those competencies and skills. So everyone involved in assessing candidates should have the necessary training, for example, interviewing and testing um, we have a lot of, um, within assessment centres, there's a number of self-assessments such as personality tests, um, verbal reasoning. It's not something you can just print off in the morning and someone can go in and score. It's something that has to be invested in and those people conducting them and assessing them need to be trained to do so. Otherwise, again, we increase the chances of unconscious bias just creeping into our process. Okay. So this seems to have been held as a sort of the holy grail when it comes to equality and fairness and that level of sameness, so consistent approach to recruitment selection, so artificial intelligence. So recruiters are increasingly using AI to make the first round of cuts and to determine whether a job posting is even advertised to you. Actually, what we're starting to see even more so is in, it's not just the initial cut off the top, they are using AI to interview and select that final candidate, that final hire. 
and um, so it's it's getting much closer to that final selection so often it's based on data collected about previous or similar applicants so these tools can cut down the effort recruiters need to expend in order to make a hire so it's cost saving it's time saving Last year, 67% of hiring managers and recruiters surveyed by LinkedIn said AI was saving them time. So it sounds great. Um, those of you who are involved in re recruitment and selection know that with, that with some jobs, you will get an insane amount of applicants and often a lot of applicants that just aren't suitable, people who haven't generally self-assessed very well. And um, that could be down to the fact we haven't put out a very... Um, a very detailed job description or person spec or it just could be people chancing it trying their luck with that in mind then what do we think about ai in the recruitment and selection process and its impact on equality do we think it is able to increase equality and equality of opportunity any opinions on that one And so I'll see a little flash, which I think means someone's typing, Paula, but I'm not 100% sure. So. Okay, I will get myself ready. <laughs> Possibly. Maybe it might not be as well. Um, okay, so despite the fact it tends to cut down the time used to select um, the potential candidate, actually we can see in that middle point there, it's often based on data collected about previous or similar applicants. Now, if you've had a number of applicants leave in quick succession, from a business point of view, they may not be the right person for it. So we may, there may be something wrong with what we're advertising. Um, but on top of that, it may be that we're recruiting and appealing to the same person, the same portion of society each time. So if it's based on what came before, it may not be meet, meeting the needs of what we need in the future in saying that's one year two years five years down the line was that um a comment yes, we've got a couple of comments um Holly, there are studies on ai that have shown it's not quite there in being diverse yeah um and from sean it may have its place but i think it may disadvantage career changes yeah good point you know i haven't considered that that's an excellent point absolutely and what we're actually finding with talent management at the minute is that um, there are many jobs being left vacant because there just isn't the talent out there and what we're advising people to consider is people outside of the traditional professional pool it might be that we what we do is we look at the skills we need not necessarily the previous experience or jobs well in that case i'm not sure how ai is going to identify that so if someone has gone um from a previous industry or sector that wouldn't traditionally fit into the one we're recruiting for would AI actually pick up on that it doesn't only disadvantage the candidate it disadvantages us as organizations it means that we miss out on that top talent perhaps so that's a really good point absolutely and it's certainly something that unnerves me it's something I think that we really have to be critical of and um, because I don't think it quite aligns with our diversity and inclusion agenda just yet there's a lot of work to go and what I'm really hoping is that it doesn't just um, negate the need for HR people thereafter. So we really need to think smart about how we can embed this into what we do as HR practitioners, but certainly not replace. I think without that human element, I think we run the risk of missing opportunities. Was that another comment, Paula? Yes, from Alison. It works if screen on competencies rather than skills. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that, Alison. Okay, so I'm a bit conscious of time. So pay and reward is the second um, area that we're going to look at. Again, by no means are these the only processes that we should be driving equality forward through, but they're just the ones that are closest to what I would be teaching. Okay, so pay and reward. Some of the ways in which we can ensure that we are driving equality is through the 360 degree appraisal to overcome bias. Now, um, I'm, I'm confident many of us have had an appraisal, so it's traditionally they're annual. I'm hoping your experience of this is beyond traditional, that they are more regular. Um, as organisations move forward, we're moving towards continuous appraisal systems or continuous feedback systems as opposed to the traditional appraisal. But a 360 degree appraisal 
Um, this relates to appraisal systems whereby a number of stakeholders are approached about your performance, um, about general skills or competencies that we're looking to measure within the appraisal system. What it does is stop the managerial input being the overriding factor um, because we can't 100% eradicate unconscious bias through training through awareness training it doesn't it doesn't happen like that's so what we need to do is put measures in place that dilute these unconscious biases during these and um, processes that are subject to human error and one of the other ways is the gender pay gap reporting so we all legally have to report the gaps um, and it's what we do with that information. Now, surprisingly, since it became a legal requirement for the larger organisations to release their gender pay gap figures, um, the assumption was that they were going to do something about it. What we've actually found is that people are just becoming okay with it. It's out there, we know the information, and we've just become okay with it. It's just normal. An organisation that is able to do something with the, that data um, will stand out from the crowd. It will make you a competitive recruiter if you're able to turn that around into something positive. So that's something to consider. Again, there's that term, unconscious bias training for your frontline managers. Um, rigorously and consistently apl applying pay styles. Now, this isn't generally, um, it's not something you can do in all sectors. Um, we see pay scales and very rigorous pay scales within the education sector and often in the public sectors. Um, and what it allows us to do is base someone's pay on experience, the qualifications that they've got. It doesn't leave a lot of room for being a competitive payer, if you like. So it's not as popular in the private sector. So when we go to externally recruit, um, it can be difficult if we are held or bound by pay scales. So there are some negatives to that. But if we can justify someone's pay, it stops any level of resentment between people. It stops there being inconsistencies between particular societal groups. It would be a really good idea if more organisations would explore the flexible and cafeteria approach to reward. So offering an, a bundle, a range of benefits to our employees um, that address the needs of our employees. Um, not just um, flashy cars, nice holidays, those sorts of things. It's about um, making sure that we provide uh, childcare provisions, perhaps childcare vouchers, um, and considering those with families and other needs. Okay, something to bear in mind when it comes to pay and reward is Adams's equity theory. So it's very much so concerned um, with the inconsistencies between inputs and outputs, or should I say consistencies. So as employees, we want our outputs to match what we're putting in. Um, more than that, the next level to this theory is what we don't want to see is inconsistencies between us and people we consider to be our equals, so people who we consider to do a similar job. Um, so any level of inequity can cause low levels of motivation, it can cause us to want to leave. Um, worse still, if people are feeling that levels of inequities that they remain within the organisation can become quite negative um, and that tends to spread through. So what we need to make sure is that um, the inputs um, versus outputs seem to be balanced, but not only that, the inputs versus outputs of colleagues who do a similar job are also matched. And that is more important, actually, than the inputs and the outputs being measured off. It's about the comparative factor between us and people that we consider to do a similar job to us. OK, finally, we're going to quickly look at talent management. So we can build and drive equality within the organisation through flexible working practices. As I mentioned earlier, if we don't need people in the office five days a week, can we actually make it so they don't need to be? Can we build that into the job and make the most of that? We need to review and challenge progression data. So are there particular demographics within our organisation that seem to be progressing quicker than others um, or more than others? Why is this? Are we looking into this data before it becomes a serious problem? Um, reviewing this allows us to make sure we have diverse workforce at all levels within our organisation, not just at the lower levels, but across the board. As soon as you've got that, we create role modelling and that starts to really improve your brand image and it starts to improve your recruitment and selection. So as I'm talking through this, you can see none of these processes work in silo, in isolation. They all link together. They all have a knock on effect with each other. Again, Unconscious bias training for our frontline managers, making them self-aware about those underlying unconscious biases, 
The key to this is making sure that we highlight that unconscious bias is natural, it's human, it's about what we do with it, it's about managing it. And then positive action as we, um, we covered earlier. Okay, there's a quick video here which I'm going to play. Um, bear with me, I may have to do it a bit of a clunky way. The unconscious mind is amazing. It can process vastly more information than our conscious mind by using shortcuts based on our background, cultural environment and personal experiences to make almost instantaneous decisions about everything around us. The snag is, it's wrong quite a lot of the time, especially on matters that need rational thinking. Here's a classic example. A bat and a ball cost one pound ten pence. If the bat costs one pound more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Most people, including over 50% of students at some of the world's leading universities, get the answer wrong and say ten pence. The answer is actually five pence. Many of us choose ten pence without thinking. This is because our unconscious mind uses instinct, not analysis. So our unconscious is fallible. It's also biased. It makes snap judgments of people we meet, categorizing them according to gender, social and other characteristics. In milliseconds, we judge whether somebody is like us and belongs to our in-group. These are the people we favor. So men might favor men, while women might favor women. However, we can belong to different in-groups, and we like to be part of an in-group that's powerful, which could mean a woman favoring a man over a woman. That's unconscious bias. All of us have it, and it colors our decisions without our realizing. For example, research reveals that if I were a man, you would be more likely to be nodding in agreement right now because people pay more attention to a male voice. The Royal Society fosters excellence in science, but this can only be achieved if we select from the widest range of talent. And that's not possible if unconscious bias is narrowing down the field for non-scientific reasons. To lessen the impact of unconscious bias, which is easier for us to notice in others, we are raising the awareness of unconscious bias to members of our selection and appointment panels. We're encouraging panel members to deliberately slow down decision making, reconsider reasons for decisions, question cultural stereotypes, and monitor each other for unconscious bias. We can't cure unconscious bias, but with self-awareness, we can address it. Okay, just a little point on that unconscious bias when we're talking about recruitment and when she spoke about the, the preference with women selecting men. And there's been a lot of research in this. It's a really interesting area. And if you are part of recruitment, it's re it'd be a really interesting one to go and make yourself, um, make yourself aware of. And um, there's been a lot of research with regards to CVs and it reiterates the importance of taking unnecessary information away such as names um, and gender or anything that suggests the gender of the applicant, because actually women are um, more inclined to select um, a male who is potentially less qualified or suitable for the role than a female. Um, it's a really interesting one. There's lots of research out there on this. Um, and it's, these CVs were written to um, meet the needs of the uh, job role. And in a study, women still were selecting the less qualified male in the situation. So it's an interesting one to go and have a look at. And we look at that a little bit on the module too. Okay, um, just to consolidate this and bring it together, I've put together a few very general tips um, to help with the promotion of equality and overcoming workplace discrimination. So firstly, identify and prevent unconscious bias. Generally, this is through training, um, which comes back to HR. Um, put equality policies in place, so formalise them, have a frame of reference to pull people back to. Mind your language, um, so as HR we should be setting an example about how we talk about people, removing stereotypes from the language we use. Um, as a blonde woman in a workplace, I've heard them all, so it's that sort of thing. Yes, it's said in jest and the age-old banter, but it's not acceptable and what it does is just um, extends these stereotypes within the workplace. 
and um, use objective criteria, particularly when it comes to recruitment selection, rewards and benefits, making sure that we are using a competency framework um, to refer back to. Um, be proactive, don't rest on your laurels. What looks like equality today may not look like equality tomorrow. We can't just put it in place, tick it off and never revisit it. We must keep going back, reassessing it, embedded new policies and procedures to continually push equality, diversity and inclusion forward. Uh, get advice if needed. There's lots of services out there. I'm sure many of you have already used ACAS and CIPD. There's lots out there. Um, and watch out for the indirect discrimination. It can actually be some of the most damaging. Direct we can deal with, it's relatively easy, but it's the indirect discrimination that really puts pressure on us maintaining a, um, an, an equal opportunity. Um, links here, I'm not sure if these can be shared, but there's a few links here for you to go if you're interested in any of these. Um, which I hope you are, um, there's five articles for you to go and read. They're relatively short, some are fact-based, some are a bit debate-like, um, but they're very interesting and worth going and having a little read just to extend your knowledge on this today. Okay, and that's it from me. If you've got any questions about the topic or about the course, I'll attempt, I'm not the course leader, but I can certainly attempt to help out with any of that if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much, Alex. That was really interesting. You're really, welcome. really good. Thank you. you covered so much. Um, we've just got a comment in the Q&A about AI um, from Holly. Um, if the teams building the AI algorithm aren't diverse, then um, it is flawed. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And these are the things we look at. We try to break this down um, because ultimately it's still to a degree. Um, it's obviously becoming smarter, but right now it's still subject to human um, impression and influence. Um, and also Holly asks, will we have a copy of the slide sent out um, and feeds back? Uh, thank you, that was great. Um, so yes, in answer to that, if um, Alex is happy to share the recording, um, we will be posting it on University Centre Telford's YouTube channel and on the Centre for Lifelong Learning YouTube channel. Um, so we'll put a post on our Facebook page when, when that's done. Um, so um, it will be available on there. Um, okay. Has anyone else got any comments for Alex? Any questions? Um, just a, a, some more feedback, Alex. Really interesting session. Um, thank you from Sean. So some really good feedback. And if anybody is interested in the course, please um, let us know at University Centre Telford or at University of Wolverhampton in Stafford or Alex. Um, and um, it's on the University of Wolverhampton website as well. Um, so we can all answer questions uh, about the level seven postgraduate diploma in HR management. Don't think there's anything else coming through for the moment, Alex. Okay, no problem. Well, if anyone does have any questions, my email address is on the front. I'm happy to field any of those or at least signpost you to the person who knows the answer anyway. So no problem. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Alex. That was Thanks excellent. Me, Thank you very much to everyone who's attended. Um, thanks for taking the time out from, from your lunch break. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Shelley, as well. No problem. Thank you. Thank bye. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.